Okay, I think we're good now, maybe. So yeah, yep. that's perfect. Perfect. Okay, hello, everybody. Welcome to Uncle Bobby's uh, Coffee and Books. I'm Mark Lamont Hill. I am the owner of Uncle Bobby's Coffee and Books, and I am very excited uh, about tonight. As you know, uh, since the day we opened, we have had a series of amazing writers, poets, journalists, scholars, you know, all of them just wonderful authors who have something important to offer the world. And the person we have tonight is actually pretty cool because this is her first author event at Uncle Bobby's, but she is like a staple of Uncle Bobby's. So many of our teachings, so many of our panels, so many um, just of times where she's just hanging in the crowd with authors um, and hanging out with the, at the shop having coffee. Um, she's a dear friend. She's really one of my favorite writers. Uh, and she wrote a book that I was so excited to read this summer and I got to read it again last night and I liked it even more the second time. Uh, the book is called Against the Loveless World. Susan Abulhawa is the guest. Welcome, Susan, so good to see you. Thank you, Mark. I'm super excited to, to have my first event with Uncle Bobby's. And um, yeah, Uncle Bobby's is an institution in Philly and it's it's a blessing to the whole city. Oh my God, well, thank you. You're, you, you are uh, a blessing to the whole city as well. The work you do, uh, as as an activist, the work you do as an organizer is so important. And sometimes you do so much other stuff that I forget that you're also like this amazing writer who does all this great uh, this great work. Uh, Mornings in Janine was a wonderful book, and it, it it's what got my wheels turning. Um, but when I read this, this felt like a different level to me. It it it, it, it struck my heart in a different way. Um, talk to me about against the loveless world. So. Um it is, you're right, it is slightly different um, from my previous novels. Uh, I, it's the first book that's actually told entirely in the first person, um, which I discovered actually later was a lot, it was hard to do. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's principally the story of one Palestinian woman who, uh, who begins her life in Kuwait. She's, uh, um, when you meet Nahar, she's kind of this very shallow, sassy, um, girl of really humble ambitions. She she's dreaming of the perfect man, um, modern appliances to make her friends jealous. Um, you know who she she imagines. You know making um, women jealous when she dances because she's this amazing dancer. But um, she very quickly, you know, um, as life does, kind of, uh, you know. <laughs> doesn't unfold the way you think it should. Um, and that happens to her and she finds herself a jilted young wife. Um, and and the story, just uh, her fate really um, unfolds from then on. She um, ends up turning to sex work for various reasons. Um, and then the invasion of, uh, uh, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait happens. She, that's kind of the backdrop to her story. As well, um, she, she finally makes her way to Palestine, where uh, where the, her greatest transformation happens. And by the end of the book, she's unrecognizable from the person you meet in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's one of the powerful things. And for those who have had the opportunity uh, to read the book, you know what I'm talking about here. Uh, the way Susan uh, paints portraits of characters, for me. Uh, is incredibly important because there's a moral complexity to them, there's a beauty to them, um, but there's also an accountability to them, right? Like you don't let your characters off the hook at the same time that you don't mark, you know, some books you read and they feel so didactic, they feel so, so I, I feel as if I'm getting a, an after school special about people. Uh, when it comes to Nahar, the thing that I found interesting was, and I don't, again, I, I, I don't want to ruin the, the book for full. So, but, but I, I think it's fair to say as she's turning the sex work, the, the circumstances that get her there, the gender politics uh, mm -hmm. that shape life in Kuwait and elsewhere, um, kind of, these are all part of the story that get her there. Um, right. I, who is Nahar to you? Um, that's a good question. I mean, you know, all of my fiction, all of my characters are fictional. Um, they're a combination of imagination, uh, of experience, of, um, of research. And, you know, with, with fiction, you kind of, 
get to know characters in the same way you get to know people. Yeah. Um, they, at least, you know, my experience in writing is that once you get to know them, they kind of, they kind of write their own story. And, and I'm just like, I'm the conduit in a way. Um, so I really love Nahed. I mean, she, I mean, I, you know, you always have feelings about all your characters in one way or another, but I have to say of, of all, all the characters that have populated all my books, she's the one that, um, kind of just stays is she's in my heart and I and I really um I loved her like I you know I want to be like her <laughs> I was gonna say there's a way I when I read not I didn't think oh that's Susie but there was a way when I read the book that there were pieces of people I, like you know there's a character who loves to dance right and I'm thinking okay that, that's something that you're passionate about is does that inform the character you know there's a freedom and in, in, in a self-assuredness and in, in, in a desire for greater levels of liberation I'm like that feels like you but i, I know yeah. you're, not, you're not the character but i want i always think about sort of how people leave little hints of themselves in all the characters in the books that they write yeah and, it, and i think sometimes you do it unconsciously um oh. i wasn't trying to to you know put pieces of myself into my head. I mean, I put some of my experiences in her life, things that I know, like my familiarity with Kuwait and, and, you know, and things like that, but not necessarily my personality, but people who know me well, who've read this will say, you know, I see you or something like that. Um, so yeah. No, it's absolutely true. One of the things that you do in your work, um, not just your political work, but your fiction is you find ways to educate the world about Palestine. Uh, but not again, not in a didactic way. It, it comes up as part of the narrative. Even the choice of Kuwait is an interesting one. Um, there's a place in the book uh, where you say Palestinians who had been chased out of their homes in Jerusalem, Haifa, Yaffa, Akka, Janine, Bethlehem, Gaza, Nablus, Nazareth, Mejdal, and every major Palestinian city found a place in Kuwait. Just that sentence alone gives people a whole education about the Nakba, about the great catastrophe of, mm -hmm. catastrophe of 1948. Uh, and of course, 1967. How intentional are you when, when you go into the book? Is that one of the goals, or does that just happen because that's who your characters are? Yeah, no, it's actually um, it's definitely never one of my goals. And as a matter of fact, I really because <clears throat> um, I, you know, I think writing fiction is is a totally different ball game, especially when you're writing historic fiction. Because um, and also, but you know, being an activist, um, there is a t you know, there is a part of me that yeah, I, you know, I want to educate but um that i intentionally kind of try and turn that off when i'm writing fiction because um i try to keep a one-track mind and a one-track loyalty when i'm writing and that's just to always be loyal to the characters um and to tell their story um and not not my story you know that's like that's the that's the tricky part for me is really and it, it always and it happens in the rewriting and the rewriting i think in the early drafts which are complete crap by the way my early drafts are just you know i'd be embarrassed for anybody to read them but the you know the the love and the the emotional connection i have with the characters happens in the rewriting and um and you know they they feel a certain way and they know a certain life they they have their own thoughts and so this political background is part of their reality, so it is important to um, to uh, to present that. And so, like in the case of Nahed, for example, you know, when she's young, she doesn't care about Palestine, right? She's like, you know, her parents are getting on her nerves. They keep talking, or her grandmother is always, um, you know, she, she doesn't want to hear any more stories about Palestine, mm -hmm. and that's, and that's real too, you know. That's um, so. But that's not me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Man, let's talk about the backdrop to this. I mean, obviously, Palestine looms large in the book. By the time uh, we move to the uh, fourth act, but there's a way that I mean, in, in Iraq, Kuwait, they play a role too. Why did you choose that as the backdrop? There are Palestinians in Jordan. There are Palestinians in Latin, Latin America, South America. I mean, you could have picked a lot of places. Why was Kuwait and Iraq and that moment so important to you? Um, for a couple of reasons. Number one is um, my familiarity with Kuwait. I mean, I was born there. Um, my family actually, there. I still have family there. A large part of my family actually had to leave Kuwait in that exodus after um, the U.S. invasion. Um, so there's there's uh, something that there's it's personal. Um, 
But the other, but the other and more important reason is that that event really and completely reshaped um, that entire region. Uh, you know, the whole, all of these imperial wars in in the Middle East. Um, you know, post the colonization of Palestine, the you know the the, the modern day imperial wars kind of started right there, um, and it just you know, other countries have been falling like dominoes. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, it reshaped Palestinian uh, destiny, like all our entire collective destiny. I mean, the Madrid conference um, really emerged from, from that moment. And then the Oslo Accords, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a, a very important, as you pointed out, set of political events that sort of shaped the reality. Again, one of the things I love about this book, and for everyone who hasn't bought the book, this really is a special book. If you want to learn about Palestine, I mean, there's stuff in there too. But for me, this book is less about that. It's just a rich novel that not only gives you an important historical backdrop of a, of, of a key period in history, in the same way that uh, reading Toni Morrison's Beloved gives you a historical backdrop, right? But, it, but there's also a way that this book gives you a, a, a thicker layer of understanding of what it means to be human in these moments. Um, did, you just, did you just put me and Toni Morrison in the same breath? I love you for that. It, it, I mean, it, it, this book is really That's special. Like overwhelming. Honestly, God, this book is really special. And I was, I, I, I read, um, I, I've spent the last year reading a lot of uh, Middle East fiction. And um, one of the things that I've always, it's always circles in my head as I'm reading various people is the question of gender and how gender is represented. Um, What's your sense, first of all, of sort of how women characters in particular get represented? And and you very clearly push back against many of the conventions of how uh, Palestinian women or Arab women more broadly are written in written even by women authors. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, um, you know, Palestinian writers who write in Arabic have a lot of limitations on what they can publish in the Arab world. So that's one of you know that's one reason why sometimes. Um, women are written the way that they are um but i and even like so I, I like i have some at least one very prominent palestinian that i'm sure you know too um but i'm not going to name was actually very upset with me for when he found out that i was writing about a palestinian woman who uh who becomes a sex worker yeah. and and he just he, he felt like we have enough to deal with. Like this is, it's, it's kind of the dirty laundry uh, discourse, which I, you know, um, I don't like that. You just can't have those considerations in fiction. And, um, and also I'm, I'm just really interested in, in people who are um, people who are forced to live on the margins of society, you know, people who are, you know, outcasts and, um, who who break people who break the rules and and I'm interested in the lives of women especially, um, and and because I write in English, um, and I have to say even you know I, I know I just said like I have a one track loyalty, um, there was something slightly different with this book and it's because it dealt so much with um, sexuality and patriarchy. Um, I I was very aware of this Western gaze that, um, and I was terrified actually of falling into like Orientalist traps. So I want to, you know, on the one hand, this story has to be real and has to be honest. Um, and on the other hand, there's this kind of Western gaze just kind of waiting to to prove, aha, uh -huh, you know, your your men are shit and your women are this. And so so there was that. Um, and it was a, uh, you know, so I did have to kind of walk that line and keep, and I questioned myself over and over with different scenes and things like that. Um, yeah. It, that makes a lot of sense. You know, uh, I, I was thinking about Gayatri Spivak, the great theorist who talked about sort of the Western mission and the kind of or, the way imperialism and Orientalism and all these things kind of conspired to create this narrative of white men needing to save brown women from brown men, right? That that the, that the like you said the men are shit and the women are oppressed and there's also the exoticization and sexualization of that stuff. I think what a lot of people, particularly the black um, people here in the audience who are watching, don't realize is that some of the same respectability politics and fears we have of kind of that dirty laundry and exposing ourselves to the world 
um, that other other communities, other cultures have as well, uh, for the very same reasons. Like we want to tell the story. There are people who who are there are bad people. There are there's patriarchy, there's violence, there's sexual violence, there's exploitation. But we don't want that to be the whole story of our culture or of our community. Were there moments where you had to pull back and say, okay, this happens, but I I, I can't write that because that that Western gaze will will, will emerge and say, aha. So um, no. I, I didn't want to hold back anything because I, I mean, I just, I really just wanted to be true to Nahed. I wanted, I wanted her life to be, um, to just be laid bare. And she's a remarkable woman. Like I, you know, I admire, so there was really nothing, um, there was nothing to be ashamed of. Um, and she was, you know, she was very unapologetic about her life. I mean, secretly inside she, she felt shame and she, um, and all kinds of other feelings about what she did, but she had this really hard exterior and um, and, and was very unapologetic about her life. So that's that was my mindset in in writing this. Is that you know I just I I just have to be true to uh, to the characters and and tell them honestly. And uh, uh, and I did I searched for you know. Um, I searched for like unconscious kind of colonized mind bits, you know, to see. Yeah. and I had a couple of friends read it because that, you know, I didn't, I wanted to tell the truth and I didn't want to fall into those traps. And, and this is, you know, hopefully it worked. I don't know. Um, I think it did. I mean, there's someone writing it right now, Betsy Piet, who said, you know, thank you for humanizing sex workers. I think that's definitely something that I got from this. But for me, it wasn't just humanizing them in the sense of not framing them as monsters or immoral people but also helping us understand the pathway that, that gets you there. I, I was talking to our friend Fatima Bhutto uh, earlier today uh, about her book, uh, The Runaways, which looks at radicalization. It was the same thing. It's a wonderful, beautiful book. And it's like, how do you get, what are the things that get you to a place where you make this choice? And for me, the humanizing part, the really interesting humanizing part, especially pushing back against that Western gaze that you point mm -hmm. out, is is being able to, to if, if the audience is looking at Nahar, and you, we want them to understand not just that not have a good person who makes who made the best choices she had, but to say what are the circumstances that get us there, and yeah. they're not just interpersonal. They, the occupation gets you there, yeah. both Iraq and Palestine. The poverty yeah. gets you there, patriarchy gets you there, yeah. um, and the accountability that I'm talking about though in your book that I really enjoyed is also the way Nahar operates in relationship to older older women. The way the, the the, you know, the pressure she feels, the, 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 the kind of scrutiny. In other words, there's a generational, there, there are generational issues within these societies mm -hmm. that point out really, really well. Um, how do you get there as a writer? I mean, it's, it's not just personal reflection. Are you doing interviews? Are you talking to people? Are, you re are there other novels that inform this analysis for you? What are you doing? So, um, I mean, I, I have been um, really fortunate to have lived a life that meant I had to be in a lot of different places and live um, uh, basically sometimes at the mercy of others, you know. Um, and, you know, my life has kind of afforded me this look at people who, who behave in certain ways um, because they think you don't matter. And I, and I got to see that um, for a large portion of my life. And so, I have this kind of wealth of personalities in my head, um, and and they kind of, they come they come out in these characters. And sometimes I'm actively think like Umburak actually is um, uh, she's an imagined character, but she's also she's she's bits and pieces of a woman, a Kuwaiti woman that I knew who did this. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and I, I, want, I want to also say something about, you know, the idea of humanizing and, and sort of um, explaining how people get there. I, that, was, that also wasn't one of my goals. I mean, and, and I don't, it's not, it's not my job to make moral judgments or make excuses or, or to do that for characters. I just really like to tell their story and, um, and and let readers, you know, make whatever moral judgments they want. Yeah. I don't think that's the. I don't think that's good for a writer to do. I loved all the characters. Um, they were all flawed. They all had, um, 
you know, things that you could hate them for and things you could love them for uh, as all humans, you know, as we all know. I'm glad you went to Umbara. Talk to me a little bit about her. So Umburak is an older um, Iraqi Kuwaiti woman who um, she she she's the woman who kind of tricks Nahar into uh, sex work. And so you you kind of you, re, you a reader probably revile her initially, um, but by the end of the book, uh, hopefully you will love her too. Um, and this is. Um, I'm really interested in the relationships between women, the friendships that women um, form with each other that ha that are so sort of um, interwoven with, you know, love, and friendship, and jealousy, and and familiarity, and uh, and trust. I mean, just all the I I I really like exploring those relationships. Um, among women because they're so underrepresented, especially in literature. So, it's, and I come from a, a big family of women, you know. Um, so I, again, I mean, it's, you know, I, I personally kind of uh, uh, relate to that. Yeah, no, and, and I think that relationship between her and Umbara for me is one of the kind of intergenerational things I'm talking about in, 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 in sort of gendered relationships that I think about. Um, and I really do think you, I don't know if I love her by the end of the, of the book, but I definitely appreciate and understand. I'm an unforgiving kind of fellow. So I went, once I'm mad at you, like the first two chapters, I'm, I'm done with you. You know, I'm much nicer in real life. I'll remember that. I'm, never <laughs> <doing it. laughs> I'm nicer in real life, I promise. But with characters, I have no mercy. Um, but no, I, I think it's important. Talk to me about a little bit about what it means to be a Palestinian writer. Um, is I know when I think about what it means to be a black writer, it's, it's a very specific thing. I think about Baldwin talking about that, Morrison talking about that, both fiction and nonfiction. When, when, so, when you hear Palestinian writer, or, or when you think about what it means for you to be one, what, what, what hits you? Um, so it's not just that I'm a Palestinian writer, but I'm a Palestinian writer who, who lives in the US and writes in English. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Which, um, so, um, well, I'll tell you what my agent said. <laughs> so I, I switched agencies when I wrote this book and um, uh, uh, my wonderful agent, um, Anjali Singh, uh, was a bit astonished by how hard it was for her to sell this book in the US. And she, she just, you know, you have this big platform, your, um, your previous books did amazing and she couldn't, you know, she, but, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's hard to, to find publishers who are interested, um, in stories that don't affirm what Palestinians are in the public American imagination. Mm -hmm. So when you, so I think, you know, there's this joke we have, like, we could all be millionaires if we wrote like this, you know, Orientalist, Zionist book right about palestinians like yeah and that's i mean if we wanted to be bestsellers and you know <laughs> run away stuff like that's what you do um yeah. but it's a lot harder when the stuff you write about uh challenges popular perception of who you are and who you're supposed to be and so there's sometimes some um the literary world is still very uh it's very white and it's very liberal and there's a certain world view and which means that they are kind of the gatekeepers of of what gets published and, and who's read. And not only that, but who who's submitted for prizes, real prize. So there have been some changes, you know, um, in response to, you know, people of color just, you know, being like, yo, like we, we have stories, we have lives. And, and, you know, when you have white people write about us, it's not, um, you know, we, we have a different story than what you think we are. Anyway, so, yeah. um, so I, you know, we're still like, you know, I think Palestinians still kind of struggle for for literary space um, in the U.S. and in the Western world in general. But um, but what even what little space we have sometimes is gets tokenized and um, and rarely sort of. Uh, uh, you know, are, are, are we considered for major prizes? Now, that said, 
I want to say that I have an incredible publisher, an amazing editor um, at Atria, Simon and Schuster. Um, and I, I was telling a friend of mine, <clears throat> um, and she uh, about about it, and she decided that I was a unicorn because <laughs> my my publisher is a woman of color, my publicist is a woman of color. Um, like I'm working with this huge team of women of color, so which is unheard of in publishing, which is partly why my experience with this book has been so wonderful and amazing, honestly. Yes, no, it's great. And Atria, by the way, no cheap plug, but Atria, I, I, I published Nobody with Atria and I had a very good experience. And they were what, yeah. one of the few uh, uh, publishing houses that took our work seriously and had people of color there yeah. uh, committed to getting our books out, but also to communicating with communities of other communities of color mm -hmm. about our work, right? So I, I think that's, that's super important. By the way, yeah, um, if you have a question, uh, after discussion, we're going to be going to Q&A, uh, which will be soon. So make sure you drop your questions in now. I'll make sure that I uh, go to them as soon as possible. You talked about having outlets as, as a Palestinian uh, who's writing in English in, from the United States. But you're, in some ways, I, I, your audience is so much bigger than that. I mean, when I walk into a, a bookstore in Jordan, when I walk into a bookstore in, in Palestine specific, I mean, I remember being in Jerusalem, um, and I think I may have texted you or something, like an educational bookshop. I'm like, oh, there's, there's, your, there's your book. <laughs> It's prominently positioned, and everybody's Palestinian in the bookstore, right? But yours is, is prominently positioned. I mean, you have an audience uh, uh, in Palestine as well. Uh, do you see your, when you, some people, when they make film, they have a mode of address, they write to a certain audience. You know, they have an idea of who the film thinks you are. Uh, mm -hmm. Some authors do that. Um, when you're writing, are you writing to an American audience? Are you writing to a Palestinian audience? Are you writing to Palestinians in diaspora? Where are you, what, who, who are you thinking about? So I, again, like I intentionally try not to think about the audience. I try not to think about the audience, about the publisher, about, I don't, I don't think about the money. I don't think about um, the reader. I really just, I, again, I try to have that one track mind and, um, and, you know, and the, and I just kind of, um, cause I feel like once I start thinking about that stuff, it just, my mind gets cloudy and, and I, um, and I just can't write. So have to really just stay always with the characters and just kind of live in their world when I'm writing. I'm going to steal your your, your, your brilliant activist mind for just a moment as well. Um, I, I, a few years ago, you were headed to um, the Liter Palestinian Literary Festival. Uh, and I remember talking to you before you went and I was we were, I was trying to overlap with you because I was, I was headed to, uh, there as well. Um, and then you didn't make it in. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that speaks to with Palestinian writers and artists in general are dealing with. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the, the short of it is I was denied entry. I wasn't allowed to, um, I was, you know, thrown in this kind of jail, uh, the airport jail <clears throat> for 30 some hours and then put on a plane back to the US. And they don't really have to give you a reason. Um, ultimately, I guess, uh, because I was denied entry in 2015 before that, and they never gave me a reason then. And so this time they said it was because I was denied entry in 2015. Um, but Amira Haas, I think it was Amira Haas or Gideon Levy, I can't remember, one of them wrote about the incident, and they had spoken with um, the, you know, the authorities there. And it turned out that um, the reason I was sent back the first time uh, was because I was rude. I was I was rude to the officer and um, and even though I was interrogated for like seven hours and that's no lie, um, I was told that I was not compliant or something like that. Um, which means that I wasn't deferential, right? right. That doesn't mean that I was answering their questions but I wasn't duly deferential and um, and that's the reason, that's the reason. And, and it's, uh, and I think you see that the anger that I have over that in, in some of my books um, just, you know, I used to be able at least to visit before, but, uh, but now I can't even visit. And, you know, to, to come from a fabled, I mean, I'm from Jerusalem and which is like one of the most fabled cities in the world yeah. to, to know where you come from for, to have like the names of your ancestors going back about 10 generations in one city to know all these legends, these homes and these stories, um, that had happened in in your direct lineage for hundreds of years. And, and to be told that 
you don't have a right to inherit that heritage, to, to even live there. Um, but yet, you know, some Jewish American woman from Brooklyn who could not trace her lineage to any part of that region is, a, is the actual heir. So, you know, it's, um, you just, you know, it's, I mean, I, I, I'm, I feel really lucky that I can put my rage into literature um, because it, it it does, it eats at you. It's just the injustice of it. Um, and I don't, I know I don't need to tell you that as a black man, but um, just this sense of injustice uh, and, and the impotence that surrounds that as well um, is a driving force for me. Wow, wow. Um, there, there's so much there. It, 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 as a black man in America, I absolutely understand that, but there's still, I always say solidarity doesn't mean sameness. And there are a set of circumstances that I can't imagine. When I'm in Jerusalem and I see, um, you know, people's trash being weighed or people's homes being, you know, checked to see if there's milk in the refrigerator so that they can justify uh, taking people's uh, residency status away to get them out of Jerusalem. Uh, when, I, when I talk to people who are from Jerusalem who are now effectively stateless because they've been, they've been put out, um, it's heartbreaking, and I can't relate to that. I, you know, um, as awful as things are in many ways, it's it's a different circumstance. It's not better, not worse. It's just different uh, than what it means to be Palestinian living inside uh, the state of Israel or living inside of uh, East uh, occupied East Jerusalem. And in some, a lot of ways, your work um, helps us understand that pain. It helps us articulate, helps you articulate to us uh, the world as you see it. And, and that's why I see your work as not just high art, but as extraordinary um, political work. What you do as an activist, what you do at rallies, what you do at teaching is great, but this book is also um, an important piece of political work that helps the world um, potentially become a little more fair, a little more just, a little more humane. And I hope you understand and appreciate how valuable and rich your work is um, to all of us. There are some people um, who wanna know about your process though. I do too. I'm, I'm jealous. I, I I don't write fiction, and so I, I'll, I'll go out one day I want to try, and so I always have to pick the brain of writers uh, who are actually good at it and find out how they do it. Are you a write every day person, or are you like a I sit down, I I, I think for a million years, and I dump everything and then return to it. Um, well, first of all, thank you for those very sweet and generous words. Um, I uh, so my process. I'm first of all. I don't really have any hard and fast rules, but there are some um, tendencies that I have. So I, I'm a morning person, so I always write in the morning, like super early. I'm, I'm usually up, um, uh, especially when I'm writing about four from 4.30, and my the actual writing, the good writing that I do happens between five o'clock in the morning and maybe 10 o'clock or 12 o'clock. Um, so, so there's that. Um, I usually have the obligatory pot of coffee, <laughs> um, and I and I never really have an outline. I don't really know where the story is going. I usually start with like a seed, a kernel of something. With this book, it was um, it, I knew that it was going to overlap with uh, the Iraqi invasion and uh, U.S. invasion, um, and I knew that it would. Um, uh, that it would involve a woman who, who turned to sex work. So those are the only two kernels um, that I started with. And uh, and then I just sit and write. And like I said, I like the first drafts are really crap. And it's just really a process for me to kind of get the story, get ideas and get, you know, names and characters out. Um, and then I start, you know, I go back and I, re I rewrite and rewrite. And it's just, my so if my my process is basically a process of rewriting, <laughs> endless yeah. rewriting. I think that's the most consistent thing I hear from good writers is that it's not about the draft; it's about the second, the fourth, the tenth draft. It's about the mm -hmm. rewrite. When you're rewriting or when you're drafting, are, how do the, how do you relate to the the characters? Like, are are, are you like sitting in your house or like walking your dog in a Hassan or a Samet or just like or Bilal just talking to you? Like you. Do you, do you find yourself like engaging the characters when you're not at the computer when you're not? Oh there? yeah, yeah, yeah. I write when I'm in the shower. I write when I'm walking the dogs. Um, mm. Yeah, and I'm on, I'm not always good about. So I try to write down, you know, stuff, thoughts that that come to me. 
um, right away, but I ended up writing them on a piece of paper that I get lost and stuff. And then I remember like, oh, I had a really good idea, but I can't remember what it was. I just remember it was a good idea. So that's always a frustrating um, piece that I just still haven't managed to, you know, get get organized mm -hmm. around. But um, yeah, so, so when I'm deeply into the writing process, I'm always writing. I'm writing at every, you know, even when I'm not writing. Wow. Well, it, it certainly shows the development of it. And are there ever moments where uh, you pivot and say, the character talks back to you and says, this is not who I am? Like, yeah. really? Okay. I, I'm, I'm glad you understood what I was asking because I can imagine someone in the audience thinking that's a bizarre question to ask, but talking to novelists all the time, they seem that this seems to be something that I hear. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so, so I'll tell you, like with this book, um, those kind of conversations between me and the characters <laughs> happened around sexuality, around the sexual, um, sexuality, especially between Nahir and, um, and Bilal, because um, I actually put a lot of time and care into that because I wanted really to explore what happens to people um, when they, when 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 they're broken in a lot of ways and for Nahed, um all of her sexual experiences until that point had been deeply traumatic um and painful and yeah. but but then she finds this emotional and mental intimacy with a man and how does that sync up with her body that really just doesn't really have a good experience with sex and then on the other hand, you know, Bilal was broken in different ways. So I, I, um, how, how they came together uh, emotionally and finally physically was, um, was something that I kept rewriting and it was the characters. It was not in my head like, no, I don't want him to touch me. You know, I'm not ready to touch me yet. So there was, so yeah, I did have that dialogue with, with Nahar a lot. Wow, no, that, that makes total sense. It's such an extraordinary responsibility. Uh, there's almost like a custodial relationship you have over these characters in terms of protecting them and making sure yeah. that they are represented. And then there's a way that they're full grown adults to do what they want to do, and you're just the vessel. Yeah. And watching you wrestle with those two things, or hearing you talk about the, the wrestling, yeah, is yeah. pretty neat. Um, we have some questions from the audience. Oh, go ahead. No, please. What were you about to say? I was going to tell you a, um, a story that happened with this book. Actually, I haven't really talked about it publicly. There was a line in this book, right, um, by Umburak. And so towards the end, you know, she says, now you have to, um, for people who don't know, uh, um, Umburak uh, is originally from Iraq. And so she does end up go going back there, but her but Iraq is completely dismantled. This glorious country is suddenly in tatters and people are, are just destitute everywhere. And, um, and so there's a line in the book where, Towards the end, 9/11 uh, comes up, and you know she she says Americans are the devil. Well, there is another line in there where she says something about um, the twin towers, and you know she's she's an Iraqi woman and she hates Americans, and she has and it's a natural reaction for her. Sorry, my dogs are. Um, and ultimately, like I I had to take it out. Um, and the reason, you know, I was basically told that um, there would be less enthusiasm to sell your book or uh, for people to buy your book with that in there. So it, I had to at some point make a choice between being true to what Umburak would say, being true to her, or loyalty to Nahar, you know, to get her story out. So, um, but it, it was really, and I'm bringing this up only because, you know, you asked me before what's it like being a Palestinian writer, what it's like being an Arab writer in general, is that, you know, here's this fictitious character <laughs> who could not even speak her mind on something so profound, so, something so natural of a reaction. Um, and so that's, that's the only part of the book where I, that, you know, there's a wrinkle in my head about. Um, uh, yeah. Do you regret the choice? Um, or do you just hate that it had to be made? I think I think it was something that had to be done. Um, but I, at the same time, I regret it. Like I, I wish I was more like Nahar. I wish I would have just, you know, said hell no. That's my friend. <laughs> right, right, right. 
Wow, that's powerful. Um, some questions coming in from uh, the audience here. Faisal says, why historic fiction? The flirtation with magical realism in the blue between the sky and water was amazing. Why has Susan Abul Hawa uh, abandoned what she has once referred to as, quote, just a thread in, her, in the narrative? Um, I don't understand. I don't understand what I'm, what, what the question, do you get it? Like, no, I was hoping you did. I thought there was some, uh, something here. I guess the question, uh, let's just ask the why historic, why is historic fiction, uh, important to you? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that, I mean, that's kind of a genre that I, as a reader that I really love. Um, and in writing Palestinian stories, you're almost always going to have, um, especially if you're writing a multi generational story, uh, the backdrop is always history because we have this tumultuous history, and and it's it's not like you can ignore it because it literally shapes the lives of of the characters. Yeah. Uh, could you talk about writing the cube and how you went into describing a prison incarceration in your book? Yeah, I mean the. Um, and so that's another part of the book that I really wanted to take a lot of care with because that's that that too is a really big responsibility, right? Because I've never been imprisoned for years in in a small space, um, but there there are a lot of people who have. Um, so I I watched a lot of interviews. Um, I, uh, I I I. Spoke with people. I spoke with the Move family with um, Janet, oh, yeah. um, who you know who had spent <laughs> decades um, in prison, and many and many of many of which were in solitary confinement. Um, I read accounts by uh, prisoners of what you know. So I I did my best to imagine um, what that loneliness, that isolation, the lack of stimulation the lack of human contact might do and um and how you how you would maintain your sanity and in the case of nahed when she's in the cube um she kind of it's a tiny space of course but she fills it um i mean it's you know when you read the chapters um or at least the way i felt writing those chapters was that the space is kind of enormous she filled it with memories and and every like each wall was a was a terrain um and a domain in itself and so that's that's how she um maintained her sanity mm. if she if you can if she did actually so. right i was gonna say to the extent that one can right yeah. um <clears throat> drew goldstein said you said that you don't use an outline so how do you organize your writing including the plot the characters the timeline do you just hold everything in your head no, I just, I just write. I mean, I, I really, um, I'm not an organized person to begin with. You should see my house and my office. It's just like papers and books everywhere. Um, but somehow it makes sense. So once the story is told, I mean, once it's written, like, um, and I feel, you know, I feel like I have a really good draft. Um, <clears throat> I do go through and make sure that the timeline and everything matches up. And very often, including with this book, there are some things that, you know, that don't line up. Like, this couldn't have happened because this dude wasn't born yet. You know what I mean? So so I do have to go through and do that. And I, and I use an Excel sheet to kind of, you know, get everybody's birthdays right, get the events and sort of align all of those things. Um, and then, you know, that's uh, another layer of that happens um, with publisher because they have copy editors who, who go through and sort of try and keep an eye out for timelines. And sometimes they catch things that I hadn't caught. Oh, wow. I, I never even thought, you know, I, I know my copy editor saves my life all the time. I just, oh, yeah. I didn't think about that in fiction, <laughs> but it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, someone wrote, uh, Betsy uh, Piet wrote, you were organizing a conference for Palestinian writers slated to take place in New York City in March that was forced to postpone because of COVID. Uh, what's happening with that? We're going to have it. <laughs> it's going to be virtual. Um, it's going to be, thank you for asking that, Betsy. Um, so we haven't publicly announced it yet, but we've been reaching out um, to participants and uh, we're, we're, you know, we're pulling it all together. It's going to happen on December the 2nd to the 6th. Um, and uh, it's going to be virtual. So we'll, we'll be public publicizing more stuff soon.
Uh, hold on one second, because I think we may have lost you uh, for one second. I don't think people heard your response. Ah, uh, I was, yeah, you, I thought you froze. <laughs> um, oh. Okay, so I was saying, so uh, we are going to do Palestine Rights, and uh, it's going to be December the 2nd to the 6th. It's going to be virtual. Um, we're going to be putting out some, uh, um, pu you know, publicity and soon. It's going to cool. be on this cool. really cool Oh, nice, nice. We'll all look out for that. Oh, they did hear it. Okay, so it was me. Apparently, the problem was me. Um, so, they, so they heard the information twice. I got to hear it once, so that, that's neat. Um, uh, Mary Tortfa says, thank you for writing this. I'm really struck by what you said about Umbra. How, as an app writer, do you negotiate the censorship? Does that stifle or shift or encourage your creativity? Do you find yourself self-censoring as you write it all? How do you keep those voices out? Um. So I'm kind of practiced in my own personal life of keeping voices out. Um, that, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an Arab woman. I was never married. I have a daughter. Um, I don't make any apologies to anyone about that. So I'm practiced. I mean, that's, you know, just in general. And as, as an example, um, you know, I get called all kinds of names for as, as most Palestinians do when they're outspoken about Israel. Um, so you, you, you just get practiced, uh, um, and keeping voices out and just kind of living, uh, living your life. So um, I was able to sort of do that with Nahar as well. I mean, again, like she's, she was my priority. Like all the characters were, um, were my priority. And I, there are some things that I wanted to explore in their lives. There's some things um, that I wanted to explore with gay Arab men that are also in this book, um, with sex work, with, um, with, 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 here, with people we regard as heroes and why we regard them as heroes and why, um, and how people who are reviled um, can also be heroes, can also kind of step into that category um, of, of heroes, so. Uh, you mentioned that that's great because we have a, a question coming from uh, Sahar El uh, Shubaki uh, who says my copy is arriving in a few days so I haven't started reading it so I, I but I, so I might know the answer for this after reading the novel but why did you choose the name Naha River what's the significance so um so in the so Naha actually has several names um so Nahed come was was the name she got from her mother because during the sixty seven war um, they were crossing Nahar al Urdun the Jordan River. Um, Nahar means river, by the way, for for those who don't speak Arabic. Not to be confused with Bahar, which means the sea, because Bahar. sometimes from the river to the sea can become very confusing and challenging. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, uh, you got in some trouble for that one, Mark. <laughs> Um, so her mother sort of makes a deal with the Jordan River that I will. She's she's pregnant with Nahid at the time. She's like, I'll name my my child after you if you don't swallow us whole. And so she keeps her promise to the river and names her daughter Nahid. Um, but her father. Um, I love you, <laughs> yeah, I mean this happens early in the book, so it's not really a spoiler. Her her father names her Yahut, um, as in a kind of a drunken nod to his mistress at the time. And so that's what's recorded on her birth certificate. So she has she has the name Yaqut um, and she has the name Nahar. Uh, and she also adopts another name um, that she uses at uh, late night parties with powerful men. So she has many names. It, it, I think the father naming her after a mistress was just such a, it resonated with stories I've heard, um, not usually that overtly, but. It, it just it, for me that when I read that part of the book, I was like, "Oh, I love this book already." That that was the moment where I was I was hooked. And that, that might just be the weird dude thing in me, but I was completely uh, hooked at, at at that part of the story. Um, I think we have time for one more question, and that question is, I just saw it. It was about here we go, uh, Khadija. She says, "Susan, your literary work encompasses the dance between heartbreak and hope. As an activist and writer, what serves as a beacon of hope and inspiration for you?" Uh, to continue work during uh, moments where the occupation seems relentless and unwavering. Um, so I am not 
living under occupation. I'm not living in a situation where um, soldiers are knocking down my door in the middle of the night and dragging my kid out in their underwear and, um, and you know, beating and destroying the people I love. But I know people who are, and we all know people who are, and we all, we, we see our friends and family and people we don't know personally necessarily, but who are our uh, countrymen and women. And my inspiration comes from their lives and how they, how, how they continue, <laughs> you know, they, they continue to have hope. And I mean, without hope, without, you know, um, I mean, without that, I mean, what's, what's the point? Like we all, we, we all have it. Even, even when we say we're hopeless, right. If the situation is hopeless, um, that's not really true because then, you know, we would, we wouldn't be going out in these marches. We wouldn't be writing books. We wouldn't be, um, making art and poetry. We wouldn't be fighting. We wouldn't be taking up, you know, armed resistance or passive resistance and whatnot. All of that all of the things we do, all of the all of the ways that each of us individually and collectively strive to uh, to survive is predicated on hope, right? It's, it's predicated on wanting to see a better tomorrow. Yeah, I always think about W. E. B. Du Bois in uh, his essay um, on the passing of you know one's firstborn. Where he talks about a hope, not hopeless, but unhopeful. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a way that steadfastness, uh, there's a way that our commitment to fighting and writing and building, it's not a naive optimism that says, oh, tomorrow everything will be fine, but it's a knowledge that our struggle matters, that our uh, resistance is making a difference. And if not for the work we're doing, things would be much worse. And that the struggle may never end, but that there's victory and joy in the struggle. Absolutely. And one of the great joys is the creative process. And, and, and this book is an example of that joy. It, it, it tells a story of pain, it tells a story of occupation, but it tells a story of joy and healing and humanity and liberation and justice and growth and exploration and brokenness and pain. And it's all mixed up and that's what art is and that's what beauty is. Um, and this is a, a piece of art and a piece of beauty and I'm encouraging everyone to grab it. Um, and and buy it from Uncle Bobby's. But yes. a link. If you want to buy my book or any book at all, just there's a link here, and there's there's a there's the Uncle Bobby store on uh, on Bookshop.com, and and also from their website. Support local independent bookstores. Support Uncle Bobby's. Um, and you know, Mark, I just want to say the flip side of that too, uh, of of not doing what we do is living an inauthentic life, of living a life that. Um, where you have sold your soul and acquiesced and made money as a result. And that feels really like a horrible way to live. So it's <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty amazing way to live. You, you live with your principles, you live with yeah. honor, you live with dignity and watching you do it. I, I, I'm inspired all over again. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Mark. I love you so much. I love uncle Bobby's. Thanks to everybody for, for coming out. Oh, man. Thank you. I love you, too. And everybody, if you want to grab the book, you can click that green link right there. Buy uh, Against the Loveless World. It's out this week. It's, it came out two days ago, and it's a wonderful book. I promise you will not regret it. I'm going to go now, get some sleep, but all I'll right, see yeah. you all soon. <laughs> Bye. Bye.